So today, uh, there was quite a lot of uh, presenters who put the emphasis on interconnection, the need for compassion, for care, to, as a core component for happiness. So I want to just say a few words about that. So it's quite true that, uh, first of all, it's tempting to think that, well, you know, I'm one person. If I can take care of my happiness, it's kind of easier than having to take care of the happiness of everyone on Earth. I have nothing against it, but it's not my job. At the same time, we also know that no one can eat for you, sleep for you. So in terms of growing the inner qualities that bring about flourishing, like compassion, inner peace, inner strength, inner freedom, someone can inspire you, show you the way, but you have to do the job in the end. So that is quite true. We have to gradually, thought after thought, emotion after emotion, hour after hour, month after month, trying our best to become a better human being. But also, there could be the temptation to say, well, in that case, the easiest way to succeed will be to search for selfish happiness, because then I'm in my little bubble, I can control better the conditions, and that's easier. So now begins the problem with that, is that if you think me, me, me all day long, and then somehow you are going to make yourself very miserable, and you probably make everyone miserable all around you. And the reason is that it is very stuffy in that little bubble. Everything becomes like a storm in the glass of water. The slightest praise and you become puffed up with arrogance and vanity. The slightest criticism and you get angry or depressed. So it doesn't work. And also you become a pain in everyone's mind. On top of that, it doesn't work for another reason, because it is at odd with reality. We are not separate entities that could build up the happiness in the little corner and succeed in doing so. So it's a lose-lose situation. You make yourself unhappy and you make everyone unhappy. Now, if you look at the other scenario, yes, of course, everyone, no one wakes up in the morning thinking, may I suffer the whole day and if possible, my whole life. So one way or the other, we want to thrive, we want to see the light at the end of the tunnel. At least we want to relieve some suffering. Otherwise, if we see no hope at all, that's despair. We don't see what's the point going on with this life. This being said, how should we proceed about that? Is it just by you know, trying to achieve that in that little bubble? Well, it turns out that if you project yourself in other people's mind, even though they might be confused about where to search for happiness, and sometimes they will run to the causes of suffering, yet deep within, they have the same longing for not to suffer and to achieve well-being. So that's the fundamentals of our common humanity and even common sentience with other species. Avoid suffering. So to take that in account is already some recognizing that interconnection, that common humanity or common sentience. On top of that, it is well known that among all the different mental states that we can experience, those who are connected with love, with tenderness, with generosity, with connection, with friendship, the quality of human relationship are the major factor for our own flourishing. And it turns out that, of course, compassion, loving kindness, altruism are others oriented. So their primary goal is to bring more happiness and to relieve suffering. Therefore, it will be perceived in a very constructive way by others. So here you have a win-win situation on, the, on, on the personal experience. And in addition to that, instead of being at odds with reality, it is in harmony with the very fact that we are so deeply interconnected, so it will work. So this is the kind of uh, thing that uh, makes me believe fundamentally that although happiness in itself 
is a wonderful pursuit, but unless we connect that to altruism and compassion, we would not succeed. So why do I show so beautiful photos? Just to give you an idea what the place where I live and I've been trying for half a century to cultivate you know, those qualities. And as a photographer, every photographer wants to show his photographs, so here they are. But this being said, how can we move toward a happier and more altruistic society? So how we can go from personal change to societal change to social justice. So now, this idea we have of the I, it begins with I exist, I'm cold, I'm hungry, I'm happy. But then we have a story, the person, the dynamic stream of our consciousness, all the experience we went through our life. So all that is fine. But then, we start making it up, sort of creating conceptually a, co a notion of a self that is the core, that is unitary, that is independent, and that's the heart of my being. So here comes the trouble. Because from there, you have self-centeredness, self-cherishing, attraction, repulsion, what is going to be a threat to that self, what, is, what can be instrumentalized to what we think will benefit the self, and then hatred, desire, lack of discernment, arrogance, jealousy, suffering, basically. All that are embedded in what we could call selfishness. Now, in fact, if we understand, as I mentioned, the interdependence, sorry, and then it leads to an increased consideration for others. So altruism can be defined as the global aspiration. May others find happiness and the cause of happiness. So now, when that altruistic love or benevolence is confronted with suffering, that aspiration becomes it's a particular sort of application of unconditional benevolence is may the suffering and the cause of suffering be dispelled. So again, this leads to a win-win situation. So now, this is not just about personal experience. We are facing many challenges in our time, and one of the main ones is to reconcile the needs for the three time scale, the short term. How can we feed our children? How can we survive? How can we gain freedom if we are oppressed? Also, the short term of the economy that we know changes all the time. So then there's the need of the long term, what the Ministry of Happiness is doing, looking after flourishing over a generation, a lifetime. And that's the aspiration to be happy. We cannot deny that. A country that will be the most powerful and the richest where everyone is miserable, what's the point? But now there's a new challenge. Now, 12,000 years ago, we were 5 million people on Earth. Now 7 billion. And the tools that we have are so powerful. So for the first time, we enter the Anthropocene. We have the power to affect seriously future generations. So now we have this new long-term challenge that we need to care for future generations. Now, when environmentalists speak with policymakers and speak with economists, it's a kind of schizophrenic dialogue. They don't speak the same language. And if we assume that most of us, except a few nutcases, want a better world, so we need to sit together, the scientists, policymakers, social workers, those who deal with economy, with the short term, and find a way, a, a thread that will, a conceptual thread that will allow us to work toward a better world. Selfishness will not do the job. You know, Groucho Marx, maybe some of you know Groucho Marx, he said, why should I care for a future generation? What did they do for me? So I heard a lot of people saying the same thing seriously about climate change. You know, we will see in 100 years. Why should we bother now? So that's one of the problems. So it seems that having more consideration for others is the only way to sit together and work together towards a better world, to have a caring economics for the short term, to have more social justice, reduce inequality, favor education, people's flourishing in the midterm, and the ultimate challenge is to care for future generations. They don't exist, but they will, and they will say, you knew, yet you did nothing. But it's hard, because evolution has equipped us 
to react emotionally at the immediate danger. If I tell you there's a rhinoceros coming full speed in this room, we all get up and run. If I say it's coming in 30 years, we say you will see. So that's the problem with the environment. So now we start with our mind. From morning till evening, we have to deal with our mind whether we like it or not. And that mind can be our best friend. This is a photograph of my first teacher, someone who achieved complete inner freedom and boundless compassion, certainly someone who knew how the mind works. But the mind can be also our worst enemy. And we know that depression has been increasing in modern society by a big factor. The first onset of depression the average has gone from 25 years old to 15 years old over 20 years. So this is a serious issue. We also have poverty in the midst of plenty. Despite the increased wealth in the world, we still have a lot of wealth, but also a lot of poverty in the midst of that. And then we are abusing other species, 8 million other species, whole scale. You can't imagine the numbers. It has been evaluated that about 100 billion human beings have lived on Earth, because we were again 5 million 10,000 years ago, roughly. This is the number of animals that we kill every two months. It's a lot of death and a lot of animals. And we instrumentalize that as if it was nothing, as if it was our right. So there's something wrong. There's a gap, ethical gap, you know, walk towards a more civilized world. And we went from a small world, few people, and a big planet to just the opposite. So now, in a way, we are sort of at the edge in many ways. And if you say five years, we were at the edge of the precipice, and now we make a big step forward, that's the problem, when you are at the edge of the precipice. So this is what environmentalists call the planetary boundaries. And if we remain with this, those boundaries, we can still go on prospering as humanity, as a civilization, in the Holocene of a period of st stable climate. This was in 1900. This is the beginning of the Great Acceleration in 1950, and now we went vastly over some of the limit. We now have the technical know-how to do something about climate change, but we clearly lack political will. So why? Is it because we are dead selfish, that man is a wolf for man? Well, it doesn't seem to be so. And if you look at young children, they are much more inclined to cooperation they appreciate better people who behave nicely to each other. So as social animals, we are more inclined. Of course, we can do terrible things, but we're also more basically inclined to do good, appreciate good as well. We love cooperation, and not only human beings, by the way. Of course, there is the struggle for life, the survival of the fittest, and man doesn't always win. But it turns out, that cooperation has been much more creative throughout evolution to come to increased level of complexity than competition that exists. And also we can compete together to survive, not against each other. But there's something in human beings that go beyond that, beyond selfishness, and also in animals. You know, there's a dilemma here, should I let go or keep on holding them, my friend? But also, you know, if we get overexposed to suffering, we can fall into empathic distress, emotional exhaustion, burnout. And the research that was done, especially with Tanya Singer and Richie Davidson, who is here, have shown that we tend to confuse empathy, which is affective resonance. If you are in joy, I'm joyful. If you suffer, I suffer because of your suffering. And also, there's a cognitive empathy that I can put myself in your shoes. But if you only stick with empathy and suffer again and again because of the suffering of others, that's too much. So we need the most more constructive dimension of altruistic love and compassion. And the work that was done with Tanya Singer, especially, has shown that there are different networks in the brain. And I can't tell you the story in, in the 11 minutes that is left, but we found out experimentally and when she asked me in the fMRI to only resonate with suffering for 45 minutes, I got completely burned out. 
And when she say, give me permission to switch to altruistic love and unconditional compassion, suddenly everything changed in my brain and in my feeling and all embracing towards suffering instead of not knowing what to do, feeling distressed. So there's a courage that comes out with compassion. So there's no compassion fatigue, there's only empathy fatigue, and I think something very important when we deal with altruism and happiness. So over the last 28 years, there have been meetings between scientists and the Dalai Lama, exploring different aspects of that, and neuroplasticity is Richard Davidson, who is also sitting here. So trying to bring the best of mind training and contemplative science with modern science, especially neuroscience and psychology. So you have, of course, great human beings which are role models, at least for my life. But also you can bring some of their students to the lab and study how their brain works when they train their mind in resilience, in compassion, in altruism. Does it make or not a difference? So here's Mingyur Rinpoche, another great teacher who lent himself to those experiments. And here's the bad meditator coming out of after one and a half hour of an fMRI machine. So now for almost nearly 20 years now, those studies have been going on. And they, in, in a short, you know, it has been shown that those who have trained their mind, they have the ability to much strongly activate certain areas of the brain connected with positive effect. So here on the top, you see this blue activation is when long-term meditators engage in compassion, unconditional compassion towards others. Compared to the down graph, which is people who were told for a few days to generate compassion but have not trained over a long time, and as you can see, the difference is striking. Now, if you look at brain imaging, on the right side, you have the novices at rest, nothing happened. In meditation, nothing happened. But on the left, long-term practitioners who have trained their mind over 10,000 or 50,000 hours at rest, they rest. But when they engage in compassion, there's a strong activation of area related with parental care, with sense of belonging, with empathy, and all those positive effects related to pro-social behavior. So that's the result of training. You can cultivate that as skills. And even within four weeks, you already see also structural change in the brain. And now it has been shown that it is specific to the kind of meditation that you do, whether it's mindfulness, loving kindness, perspective taking. So in Richard Davidson's lab, they could show that two weeks of compassion meditation already changed your pro-social behavior. It's quite amazing. So what we need now is to create not just a, you know, what we call sustainable development. As this was said this morning about endless growth. When we speak of growth, we always think in terms of quantitative growth, more of the same. What we need is a qualitative growth, better with less, a better quality of life. We cannot and we don't have the tree Earth, planet Earth, to fulfill our endless thirst for more energy, more resources. We need to, sustainable harmony means now to remedy to inequalities, bring more social justice, and in the long term, remain in harmony with nature so that we don't overexploit it. So sustainable harmony is more about a quantitative growth. We need to realize the Holocene, the stable period of climate that has been for 12,000 years and they're starting to change now, is our paradise. This is our Eden. We need to protect that. That's the way that civilization can continue to flourish. We need to do more of a caring economics where economy is at the service of society and not the opposite. So we need to balance that. And for instance, uh, I'm sure the Ministry of Happiness does that. But the idea of gross national happiness, where you have the financial uh, measures, prosperity, financial prosperity, social prosperity, and environmental prosperity. So for instance, Bhutan, they calculated that if they would cut all their forests, their GDP would be multiplied by 10. But then they find themselves with a devastated country, so they will lose a lot of so this environmental wealth was 10 times the GDP, so better keep it. 
They also calculate, like, uh, you know, when people volunteer, this is like something that is, should be included in the GDP, not just uh, selling tobacco or things like that. If you just go by the GDP, what happens? You smoke to tobacco, GDP increase. Then you go to the hospital because you have lung cancer, the GDP increase. And then there's somebody who takes care of your coffin and there's expenses, your GDP increase. But the social wealth has been gone down because of that. So we need to go to a model that is not like that, where the financial is dominating the social wealth and environmental wealth. We need local commitment. It starts with us. We cannot say, oh, others have to do it. We need to begin with our behavior, with the, our vision, and not be discouraged. You know, if you ask people, are you ready to do something for the environment? 20% say, yes, no matter what. I will start riding a bicycle, I will do this, I will do that, I will insulate differently my house. 20 people say, I don't care, I damn. You know, I will do as much as I like, and they will see, they will find some solution in the future. 60% say, I will do it if others do it as well. So what you need is to nudge, as it was said this morning, those 60%, so that an idea becomes so compelling and so inspiring and so strong that you rally to it. If you look at the way slavery was abolished in the late 18th century in England, there was 10 wise persons that said we should abolish slavery. Everybody laughed at them in the House of Parliament. They said, ha ha, impossible. The British Empire will collapse economically. 10 years later, uh, slavery was abolished. That idea had become so strong that you could not say anymore, and today you can't say, let's go back to slavery. It's quite convenient, you know, 100 people be taking care of 1,000 people. Well, that's a good investment. You can't say that anymore. So there's cultural change, there's tipping points. So what we need in terms of altruism and the environment especially is to reach to this critical mass of people with a strong, clear, lucid, wise message and tip over the 60% so that they rally the 20% who are clearly decided. So we need, of course, to adopt the global goals. And this morning, our friend from Indonesia showed that clearly that there are also spiritual, environment, and social. So I think that's a very good way of presenting it. We need to extend altruism to the other 8 million species. You know, we can't go on killing 60 billion land animals and a trillion, that's 1,000 billion sea animals every year as if nothing happened. This is also very bad for everybody because we rode to the sixth extinction of species since, Earth, since life appeared on Earth. And the last one is back to the dinosaur time. And that's going to be a huge mess for everybody, humans included, of course. And you know, sometimes we have to learn even from those animals in terms of care, as you can see. And so we have to, so, to search happiness through altruism and compassion, not just to pursuing endless selfish purposes is not going to do the job. So there are a few wonderful books and inspiring books that you could look at. And, uh, a few from your humble servant here. And so I think Martin Luther King put it very clearly. Every man or woman, of course, must decide whether he or she will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. So you might say, well, here's this Buddhist monk coming from his hermitage. You know, he's staying in front of the Himalayas. You saw the picture in the beginning. Good for him. You know, he doesn't pay tax. He doesn't have uh, you know, 25 children to raise. Easy, you know, to speak of compassion and happiness. Look at this guy, you know, sitting on his balcony, enjoying those beautiful mountains. So what a sham. So in fact, that's why we need pure heart and dirty hands. Let's put compassion in action. So we try to do that, and just to give you, not just to advertise for what we do, but to show that this can translate when people have really a commitment and sense of determination so now to an organization that I started 17 years ago, in Asia we're helping more than 300,000 people to this organization in terms of health, education, social services in very remote areas of northern India, Bihar and Jharkhand, in Nepal, and eastern Tibet. So we just look at this investment. You are, many of you might be knowing about that. Return on investment. 
a school for 2,000 children built with bamboos for $100,000. Can you beat that? I doubt. So we built nine of those schools that 20,000 kids for a limited amount. We built clinics in the high plateaus of Tibet, 4,000 meters of altitude and schools. This is the happiest woman in the world, by the way. And we do literacy program in India. And so karuna means compassion. So that's compassion in action. And this is what gave the most satisfaction for me as an elderly monk is to have been, the, have been being able to fulfill that dream to put compassion in action. And that can tell you that gives the greatest happiness is to transform oneself to be better at the service of others. And I have 26 seconds left, so let's rejoice. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>